So uh, I'm kind of a history buff. I'm, I'm fascinated by history. And so for my birthday, I went to the Hermitage, the home of Andrew Jackson. And um, I, I guess maybe I got somewhat inspired by some of the portraits on the wall. Um, but I appreciate Josh because this morning we were talking right before I got up to do the announcements and he made notice of my facial hair and he's like, wow, that's, that's really something. And I, he was like, you should, he was like, uh, we talked about it and he was like, no, 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 don't, don't mention it when you get up there. Don't draw any attention to it. You know, and I was like, yeah, that's a good point. And then he gets, and he was plotting. He's more devious than you think he is. He was sneaky. He was like, I'm going to get up here and I'm going to throw him right under the bus. And that's what he did. So he was crafting that since this morning. So uh, I know, I know now what his plan, what his plot was. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, really, honestly, uh, we, had, we did church camp last week, and I was just like, oh, well, I'll kind of go crazy. So it was a lot of, a lot of fun we had at church camp. Um, it was wonderful. Brooklyn Beatty, who was, as we mentioned this morning, was baptized on Thursday, so we rejoice in that. We're so happy about that, and, and we just are so excited about that. And, but it's good. It's good to be at camp. It uh, gives you a different perspective. You, you see things in a different light, and uh, so we got to be together. Um, I, I saw Paul Owen in a different light. Um, pretty good. Pretty good at a tug of war. Uh, I did not know this. Um, I, I should have done this, uh, seeing him. But um, my team was against his team, and I, we lost pretty handily. So um, you know, sometimes you think, "Hey, he's just a pretty good song leader," and he may be really great at tug of war. You just never know. So, um, also with camp, uh, the people that went got to hear a uh, version of this sermon, as it was one of the things that we talked about up there, but I just wanted to kind of share it. It's a little different audience. Uh, with church camp, I was preaching this to children, uh, and tonight, and I'm preaching it mainly uh, to adults. But I wanted to talk to you about God's discipline. And it's sometimes something that we don't always really look at and think about but perhaps you remember this phrase or statement growing up this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you or this hurts me more than it hurts you and i if i'm honest i'm i'm not old enough for um i did not ever pick my own switch i did not ever have that luxury i don't know if we we lived in the city so it was just sort of like a belt would have to suffice so I did have many a paddlings, uh, an occasional belt whooping, um, and those are bad. Those are not fun. Uh, and again, as I mentioned to the kids, it may be a shock that I wasn't the best child. So I needed discipline. I needed reprimanding. Uh, and I told the kids, and, and for me, the worst was certainly, you know, wait till your father gets home because you have that building you know, uh, of anxiety and fear. But even sometimes worse to me was if I was goofing off, I always remember it in the grocery store. I'm doing something silly. And my mom would grab a hold of me in one fell swoop. I don't even, still don't know how she did it, but she would grab me, pull me over, give me a swat, and then push me back over like nothing ever happened. And then I was supposed to just go on like that didn't just happen. And so then as a little boy, you're just kind of looking around like, I'm so embarrassed. I hope nobody saw that, you know, and then the fear of mom is back, you know, where it needs to be. So it was, it was scary as a kid, discipline, you know, it, it, not necessarily always scary, but I remember hearing this, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I thought, man, what a lie that is. You know, there's no way this is, this is miserable. There's no way that you can be more miserable than I am right now. But as you grow and as, as you grow as an adult, it makes more sense. You begin to understand that it's not fun to discipline your children. It's not fun when you have to reprimand them, when you have to correct them. But you do it because you love them. And God disciplines us because he loves us. Because he's good. He knows that he has to discipline us. He is a good God, and so therefore he has to be just. He has to correct us. With God's people, what we talked about at camp this week, we talked about the idea that when God's people go away, 
oftentimes they're disciplined by being allowed to be in captivity. And Jeremiah was, was one that was very good about speaking about this and saying, you come back to God and then things will be okay. But God was disciplining them. God was correcting them. And God doesn't want to do that, but he has to. He has to correct us because we're going to sin. We're going to do things the wrong way. He explains it in his prophets in Jeremiah and Isaiah that if you do what God wants you to do, then God is going to protect you. God is going to provide for you. He promises resp- restoration that things will be restored. But it's hard for us with our parents, with our children, with God to understand discipline sometimes. I want to look at Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. Let's see if I can get my... Hebrews 12, verse 5. And I sent that in as the wrong thing, so pay no attention to this verse up here. But I'll read this for you. Hebrews 12, uh, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have, had, we have all had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjugation to the father For indeed, for a few days chastened us as he seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we have this idea and we understand God disciplines. And we know and we see, as we read, God disciplines because he loves us. Again, with children, the reason we correct is because we want them to avoid the mistakes that we've made. We want them to avoid the pain that we have suffered. We want them to be careful, to be safe. And and a lot of times kids... Kids don't understand that. It's it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to explain. The younger a child, the the more difficult it may be. This morning we were um, trying to shoot some videos for VBS and and we had one little girl and she she came and she was going to do a part and she was going to just hold a artifact. But she didn't understand what we were trying to do and, and she got upset. She started to cry. We weren't trying to to reprimand her. We weren't being hard on her. We were just trying to allow her to do this, but she didn't understand. And we've all been there with our kids when we say, you know, no, and they get upset. As young kids, when when we try to tell them, no, don't touch the stove. Or when you're holding their hand and and they, they want to pull away and you say, no, you have to hold my hand right now. We're going to cross the street. You got to stay with daddy. You got to hold my hand. And sometimes, as human nature is, we, we want to resist. They want to resist. So we have to discipline. I won't even get into teenagers because mine are about to drive me crazy and I probably won't be able to say anything nice about them up here. But they, why? Why do I have to do that? I don't know how many times I've said because I said so without wanting to throw something at them but they question everything why do we got to do that I don't want to do that 
but we have to correct them. Because, because correction is done out of love. And it's done out of the things in life that we want them to learn. And the same is true with God. God corrects his people because he says, I want you to be with me in eternity. This path that you're going down leads to sin. This path that you're going down leads to death. This path that you're going down could lead to hell. So he corrects us. He wants us back on the right path. So he, he disciplines us in his word. God is not being mean to us. He's disciplining because he loves us. One thing we talked about was it is a lot easier to build fat than it is to build muscle. I would definitely be an expert on this. Trust me, I know this. It's really simple. You want to eat something and then you just want to sit down. That is a great way for you to build fat. Okay? To build muscle, it's a little bit different. And this one I'm not as much of an expert on. But I do know that you build muscle by breaking it down and then allowing the muscle to rebuild itself. Resistance, stuff that goes against the muscle, is what builds muscle. Scripture tells us this. Iron sharpens iron. We can't be stagnant and grow. There has to be resistance. There has to be a pushback against for muscle to build. And the same thing is true with our spiritual walks. In order for us to be spiritually healthy, we have to face resistance. We have to face hardships. It's very dangerous when we become stagnant Christians when we don't do anything. We have to be careful that we do not fall into that same trap. Because God's love is not going to allow us to fall into that trap. God loves us too much to allow us to get lazy. And he will push against us because he loves us. As we get ready to wrap up, the, the final thing that, that I want to share with you is this, and it's, it's interesting wording. And whenever I, I quote this proverb, people always like to check me on it, like to look at it and make sure I read this correct, especially the kids that I teach. They always say, does that really say that? But Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1 says this, Whoever loves instruction loves instruction knowledge that's fairly simple if you love instruction you love knowledge you hear people teach and you say i want to know more you sort of sort of lean in and say well, hmm, tell me more all of us have things that we love to hear about that we love to learn about so in some ways all of us love instruction in some things but there are times when we will not want to be corrected. Because the second half of the verse says this, But he who hates correction or reproof is stupid. And again, that's New King James. That's what the translation says. He who hates correction is stupid. And it's kind of one of those things that you read it and then you think, wait a minute, that... that that kind of stings a little bit. I love, I love knowledge. I love instruction. I want to learn more. I want to learn more. But it's when we get corrected that we have problems. Sometimes we want to say, well, I don't do that. Or someone corrects us and that we say, no, no, no. I didn't do that. Or no, you're wrong. I did this. We don't like to be corrected. Makes us uncomfortable. 
But I put it this way with the kids. No matter, I think about the Olympic trials that we've got going on. I think about sports again and athletics. The best players of any sport in the world still have coaches. For all, uh, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, those guys still had coaches. You think about all these people that are the best at what they do in the Olympics. They still have coaches that say, here's what you need to do better. Here's what you need to work on. And we don't like to hear that. That, that makes us uncomfortable sometimes. We think, I've got this. I know, I know what I'm doing. But as Christians, we've got to be able to, to say, I can take some correction. I can hear that. I do need to do better on this. I need to work on this. I need to do a better job with this. We correct each other and we can grow from it. It doesn't have to be harsh. Correction doesn't have to be mean. Just simple correction. To say to someone, hey, maybe we can work on this together. But again, discipline sometimes is hard. And I think about God sending his son for us. The fact is, no matter with all the discipline in the world, we still won't do enough to be saved. We still cannot earn our way into heaven. Even with all the discipline. God disciplines us to make us better because he loves us, but we still won't have enough discipline to get to heaven. And that's why he sends his son. He sent his son to die so that we might live. And that truly is where it's going to hurt him a lot worse than it hurts us. That Jesus hung on the cross so that we get forgiveness, that we get the grace, the salvation that's offered. God loves us enough to discipline us, and he loves us even more so that he sent his son to die. In just a minute, we'll stand and sing. Paul will come up and, and lead a song, and this is again, as we say each and every week, an invitation for you to make that decision to follow Christ if that's what you need to do, to come home if you've fallen away. If there's any needs that the church can help spiritually with, we offer an invitation now as we stand and sing.